started. So welcome to everyone on behalf of Project LEAD. Uh, this was made possible with money from the U.S. Department of Education, and we're happy to have you all here for our webinar tonight on the Great Migration. Uh, as a reminder, please make sure you are signed in with your full name, and we really encourage you to keep that chat active throughout the discussion. There will be a 15 minute Q&A session at the end and you can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So we'll take those questions at the end, but feel free to chat throughout and keep that discussion lively. Some of our upcoming webinars we have on February 28th, Sarah Wasberg, who is the food historian. If you are not following her blog already, it's fantastic. Uh, so many interesting facts and cool recipes and things I never knew. Uh, but she's here to talk about immigrant foodways, the progressive era, and the development of American food. And again, that is on February 28th. And then on the 14th, we have Deidre Cooper Owens from the University of Connecticut, and she will be talking about teaching the history of American slavery. And then following that, um, in April, we have Indian Settlers and Slaves in the Age of Jackson with Christina Snyder from Penn State University. We have some other ones coming up, but I didn't want to spend my entire time <laughs> telling you about all of those. So you can check those out on our website and you can get registered for those there. And they're all at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. So if you'd like to sign up for some of those, those are all free. And there are a lot of um, great ones and we have everything posted through May. So if any of those don't really appeal to you, you can check out some of the other ones. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. We have DeVarian Baldwin with us here tonight, who is a distinguished professor of American Studies and the founding director of the Smart Cities Lab at Trinity College in Connecticut. He is the author of In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, How Universities Are Plundering Our Cities. Chicago's New Negroes, which I have a copy of right here. Um, oh, I have my screen on so you can't see it, but I do have a copy um, and I will share that with you at our next face-to-face -face for our lead teachers. And he's also the co-editor of Essay Collections, Escape from New York, The Negro Renaissance Beyond Harlem. He's a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, and his opinions and commentaries have been featured in numerous outlets, including NBC News, PBS, The History Channel, USA Today, and The Washington Post, as well as Time Magazine. So we're thrilled to have him join us today. And without further ado, I am going to pass on the mic. Thanks, Devarn. Thank you so much. Uh, this is wonderful to meet you all, if only virtually. But it's always um, always honored to be in conversation with the amazing people that do the work that you do as teachers. Um, I've been doing professional development work for now um, about 30 years, and I'm always humbled by the care, skill, expertise that it takes to put together lesson plans, to project over the course of a year, to work with young people. I have three sons myself, a little bit older now, but the days when they were in school. Uh, so this is just always an honor to have these conversations and to discuss things um with you about the latest trends in the in the history and the scholarship and how it can be incorporated um into your classroom so i'm going to share my screen as we've learned to uh hear a lot more over the last few years uh to talk about the great migration um the title of my presentation for sorry get it together the title of my presentation for this evening afternoon is Exodus from Dixie, the Great Migration as a Social Movement. So the year is 1956. The place is Houston, Mississippi. And this is young Mary Jo, who is at this picture three years old. And Mary Jo comes from a family of sharecroppers. And in that brutal farming system, poor farmers rented or leased a plot of land along with a supply of seed and other resources. And then no matter how good or bad the harvest, the shark cropper had to pay back the landlord for their use of the land and supplies. 
At the same time, this farming system preyed on poor and largely African-American workers through a corrupt bookkeeping practice. In this system, the cost of renting supplies with a never defined level of interest was almost always calculated to be more than the value of the crops. So black farmers weren't able to make a profit, even when black sharecroppers tried to fight the creative bookkeeping, they could find little justice from the local police or in the courts. They became what author Richard Wright once described as landless upon the land. So in 1956, Mary Jo's parents decided to pack up everything they owned and leave all they had known and loved in search of a better life. Like so many migrants from around the world, Mary Jo's family turned to the urban north where factories were offering the possibility of new economic opportunities. Her father would work in one of these factories and her mother worked as a domestic, just like 80% of African-American women who worked in Northern cities and towns. But economic prosperity wasn't the single motivation for this family to head North. In the quiet moments, Mary Jo's mother would look off into the void. She would mention the scent of burning flesh. She smelled in the Mississippi air at night because of a lynching that had taken place there while she was growing up. She said the smell permeated the air at all times and it never left her thoughts. So the dual forces of looking for a better economic life and frustration with the realities of Jim Crow terrorism both compelled Mary Jo's parents to move. But move where? They had family in Chicago and thought about going there, but it was very different than Houston, Mississippi. Ultimately, they decided that Chicago was too big and fast. So they headed an extra hour further north to, of all places, a town called Beloit, Wisconsin. In Mary Jo's time, Beloit had held a growing black population with a small town feel and factory jobs, a size similar to Houston, Mississippi. While a world away, including blistering cold winters, Beloit's size and pace more closely resemble their Houston home. And the black population in Beloit would continue to grow. Young Mary Jo would grow up in Wisconsin, graduate from the integrated local high school, and ultimately have a child. Yes, Mary Jo here was my mother. And her story, my story, is just one small piece of an evidence proving that the Great Migration has had a significant impact on people's lives from across the country and on American life as a whole. So today I want you to join me in an exploration of the Great Migration of African Americans that lasted from the 1910s all the way to the 1970s. It, started, it spread from the US South to change the literal complexion of cities and towns across the Northeast, Midwest, and the Far West. Some Black people followed the migratory trails of early 20th century jazz musicians up the Mississippi River from New Orleans to St. Louis and beyond. Others answered the calls and letters of friends and family who had grown, who had gone before them from the Carolina Piedmont to New York and New Jersey or from Louisiana and Texas, west to California, or Washington State. Sometimes family members were left behind, but traditions and memories always travel with them, melding and infusing American culture with a new lifeblood in urban politics, organized labor, the factory floor, and everyday life. In their travels, in their aspirations, their challenges and triumphs, I hope you'll see how the Great Migration has also had a significant impact on your life too. To be clear, these modest black migrants, they shook up the world, but their story also shakes up the conventional stories we tell ourselves about America as a nation of immigrants and the meaning behind that phrase. The Great Migration, like many migrations and immigrations before from the American past, have primarily been seen as driven by the search for a better life within the context of what we call 
opportunity. And what that normally means and has meant is jobs. The idea is that America is a land of prosperity. There are jobs and resources here. You can come here and not only make your way, but in fact, reinvert, reinvent yourself anew. In many regards, the great migration of African Americans has been slotted into the same storyline of America as a land of prosperity and opportunity. But with the story of Mary Jo, we can begin to already see how that there's a complexity added to the immigration story when we put the Black experience at the center of the narrative. The Black experience challenges the idea of this migration as purely just a search for jobs or economic opportunity. These migrants were making a decision to leave living in a crucible of terror. Through the lives of migrants, we see a story that reveals the great migration as a not just movement of people for a better lives, but as a social movement. What many with full biblical meaning as this image before you states, understood as an exodus from Dixie, as a decision to quit the South, to leave terror, to make their way anew, a collective organized ethos of searching for a better life outside of the crucible of terror, beyond just simply job opportunities. So with that in mind, we must ask, so what happened? What are the facts of the Great Migration first? So the Great Migration took place in two significant phases. The first here you have is between 1915 and 1930, when over 1.5 million African Americans moved, this is important, from Southern cities and towns to the North, to the Midwest and Northeast. Then in the period between 1940 and 1970, there is a second great migration, what some call the greater migration, where over 4.5 million African Americans moved from the rural South to the North and West. So see, I grew up in the Midwest. I thought that all black people were from Arkansas, Tennessee, or Mississippi. That might seem strange, but there's a reason for that. The migration experience created a vibrant and extended community between specific Southern states and particular Northern destinations. Maps of the Great Migration show us these tracks. They are called migration chains quite clearly, and you can see them on your screen. And these migration chains continue to hold significance, not just for tracking the historical mobility of people, but also for understanding distinct Black cultural trends in different regions that persist even to this day. In the second phase of the Great Migration, we see here in blue, a growing chain from Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas to the U.S. West. Someone I know who was from Southern California always wondered growing up why she had to go to a cotillion, a coming out ball, as a young woman. Well, it was because a significant number of migrants who ended up in Los Angeles had come from Louisiana. And they grew up in a French Creole culture where cotillions were central to their heritage. Those traditions continue and were carried west as part of that particular migration chain. Even though to my friend, a cotillion seems so out of place in of all places, Southern California. Also consider Chicago's blues sound, specific barbecuing techniques, or the partnering dance style known as stepping. These are all in different ways informed by the migration chains that came from Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee. And then also, when I moved to New York City as an adult, I was confronted with a different way of being Black shaped by migration chains that brought Black people from North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Florida, and the Caribbean to the Northeast. So the various ways that Black people in the North perceived or understood what it meant to be Black was heavily influenced by the migration chain that their family traveled or the chains 
that shaped the destination where they lived. So we're starting to see what happened. Next, we need to understand and start pulling back the layers as to why it happened, which introduces us to what are called pull and push factors. According to the traditional economic view, immigration restrictions during World War I halted the movement of Black people from Southern and Eastern Europe to the US. And yet because of wartime production, industry in the North needed a labor supply. The story goes that when labor was cut off from Europe, industry looked elsewhere for workers. They sent agents to the South and pulled African-Americans North with job opportunities. Once there, migrants sent for family and friends who were also pulled to Northern cities and towns. These pull factors of America's economic promise still largely dominate how the story of the great migration is told. It is shaped by the broader immigration story of America as a land of prosperity. But we must place the pull factors of economic prosperity alongside Mary Jo's mother, my grandmother's image of smelling the stench of burning flesh in the air. When considering migration, you have to also think about the push factors, the conditions of violence, injustice, and humanity that African-Americans like my family felt when making the decision to quit the South, as some have described it. So consider racial terror. Under Jim Crow segregation, what white lawmakers called equal segregation, you had the separate but equal, but they were quite unequal, schools, separate and unequal public transportation, fountains, restrooms, even burial services. You had literacy tests and poll taxes to disenfranchise African-Americans, even when the majority of white Southerners couldn't pass a literacy test, what did Southern whites do? They created a thing called a grandfather clause. So that whereby if your lineage were not enslaved before 1868, then you were exempt from literacy tests or poll taxes. Well, why would that be? Because before 1868, the majority of black people were enslaved. So they also had etiquette and extra legal forms of harassment and surveillance that black people had to endure. My family and other families that I know from across the country in the urban North tell stories about their parents or grandparents, stories where if they were a black person and there was a white person coming the other way on a sidewalk, this is before heavily paved roads, that the black person, even an adult, had to get out into the dusty, dusty street to let a white person pass. Black people couldn't look white people in the eye. They couldn't offer direct eye contact. On the streets, if you were driving, white people had the automatic right of way all across, the, all across the South on motorways. And even if you were an adult talking to a child and you were African-American, you had to call that child uh, by, by Mr. or Miss. And that child could call you by your first name. So this is one reason, if you don't know, in the African-American tradition, why there are many children who get names like sir, madam, mister, governor. Because even, so because, so therefore, even if you didn't, even if white people called you by your first name, they had to offer you some symbol of respect. There also was this horrible convict lease system that we know about because of the documentary film by Ava DuVernay, called the 13th, because in the 13th Amendment, it outlawed slavery except as punishment for a crime. So then what happened? African-Americans were heavily surveilled, thrown in jail, and then they're leased out for public work projects to build bridges, tunnels, roads, or even leased out to private industry like US Steel at very low rates, and they ended up working for free. So people call this slavery by another name. Yet, because of the dominant ways that we talk about our nation of immigrants, this is all a part of a story that Americans are just now starting to get told over the last 20 years. 
And we still talk about the Great Migration that is simply about a search for jobs, even though we're learning these other stories about terror. So if we think about this massive movement of people as simply a quest for jobs, we can look in our current times and see that there are arguably more jobs in other parts of the world. There is a need for jobs in the US right now, and there are jobs in other parts of the world. But you can tell your students, well, think about it. You don't find Americans just getting up and going anywhere to simply chase economic opportunity. Why not? Because people don't want to leave their families, their food ways, a familiar kind of weather, a familiar language, to just go anywhere. So in short, our life-changing decisions about where to live our lives take more than just economic factors into account, even when we need jobs. In fact, we know that even during this massive exodus of millions of African-Americans, an overwhelming majority of Black people decided to stay in the South. And my family story, amongst so many others, helps point to a much broader reality of migration that reaches beyond purely economic concerns or what we call pull factors. It is the push factors that help us understand the meaning of the Great Migration as a social mobilization, a realm of collective intention, a social movement for freedom. So as teachers and researchers and students, how do we get to the non economic factors if the textbooks continue to tell the story as a search for jobs. We can look at things like oral histories, material culture, and even art. Let's, let's be clear. There is no question that jobs, the jobs that were made available during World War I were important. But at the same time, wartime job opportunities were more the means than the greater end in themselves. There are dozens of stories. This is, this is where we get to oral histories. When you read oral histories, you can see dozens of stories taken from letters of black migrants, from interviews, where they talk about taking the train tickets from industrial agents, getting north, working on the job for maybe a week or two, and then quitting and going on to live the lives they want to live in the urban north. To take advantage of what that ticket really provided, a way out of the Jim Crow South on someone else's dime. And once they got out, the migrants themselves began uh, using other mechanisms by which to tell the story, the deeper story about why they actually left. And sometimes these sources are hiding in plain sight. Consider the image at the bottom right of your screen. Most of us have seen some of these lynchings before, these lynching images before, and they can be harrowing. And of course, if you're giving a show to your students, you should give a trigger warning before you show them. But what must also be understood is how do we have this, this, this image? This image is actually from a postcard. That yes, in the same way that uh, we might take our children or young people to Six Flags or King's Dominion or Disneyland or Great Adventure or wherever you might go for amusements, people understood lynchings as public amusements that they would even take their children to because it was a teaching technique and entertain. People would bring picnic baskets and they would bring children there to teach them how to act and how not to act and who to associate with and who not to associate with, to stay within the bounds of proper decorum within a racial social order. And so because in the same way you might go on vacation and send your family or friends postcards about, look what we did yesterday. White families sent postcards of lynchings to their friends and friends across the country to say, look what we did last night. And so in that horrible form of public amusement, we also find another push factor and reason that African-Americans decided to leave the South. Another resource that we can look to, to for thinking clearly about this work would be art. The phenomenal 60 panel uh, art exhibition, Jacob Lawrence, The Great Migration Series. So if we look at one of the panels in this series, it makes it very clear in a very subtle way. Another cause was lynching. So if you, if you need a historical source, 
here we have an artist that was a product of the Great Migration saying another cause, meaning we understand that people focus on the impact of economic prosperity, but but another cause was lynching. It was found that where there had been a lynching, the people who were reluctant to leave at first left immediately after this. And as you can see here, the rope that is hanging on the tree it does not have a body in it, and the body on the rock doesn't have a head, suggesting that this lynching could be any person at any time, uh, reminiscent of the flag that hang, hung on, on Fifth Avenue out of the offices of the NAACP throughout the 20s, 30s, and 40s, the flag said, um, another man was lynched today, meaning that day, any day, yesterday, tomorrow. This image in this, in this lynching, in this, in this migration series offers the same kind of every person, everywhere, at all times, ubiquity that we see in the experience of living under the shroud of terror never knowing who it could be, if it could be you at any time. Another powerful archive for understanding the push factors for the Great Migration is uh, Billie Holiday's song, Strange Fruit. Now let's be clear, she did not write these lyrics, but they mean something so much more with the way in which she performed them. But let's just start with the lyrics. The song is based on a poem written by Abel Mirapol. But the texture and the emotional thrust of the performance was all holiday. The opening line is profound in its simplicity. Southern trees bear a strange fruit. So I want to go back. Look at how this rope is looked at as, and it could be understood as an extension of the tree, like fruit being born. So just pair, and you can do this with your students, Pair the image with the lyrics of Billie Holiday. And you can see a collective understanding of those who were either the children or the or or, or the act the, the, uh, the actors of the Great Migration, once heading north, reflecting in art, in music, in visual paintings, the reasons for lynching, for migration, excuse me, that go beyond economic opportunities. So Southern trees bear a strange fruit. Here, Southern Trees Bring a Strange Fruit serves as this haunting allegory for a lynching scene where the Southern landscape has been born, has born the strange fruit of lynched Black bodies. In the first two stanzas, we are washed over with the unrelenting juxtaposition between the beauty and hospitality of rolling green hills, Southern hospitality, but it's fertilized by black blood, hanging bodies swaying in a gentle southern breeze. The scent of magnolia flowers overwhelmed by, and think about my grandmother, the smell of burning flesh. So this continual juxtaposition with the niceties of southern hospitality contrasted with how they are born and fertilized by black death and white violence. Let's listen for a bit, if you want, if you will. So even in the music, you begin to see a blurring between the sounds of a lazy, genteel Southern day but then here it bleeds from a lazy Southern day in the South into the somber tones of a funeral march. So consider the different ways in which the lyrics and the music and her and, and, and Billie Holiday's alliteration as you'll hear in a minute, blend genteel South with white violence and black death. There is strange blood on the feet and blood at the root. 
black bar is swinging in the sun of the strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. So I just wanted you to understand, hear how the song serves as a vital archive, archival evidence for different ways in which push factors propelled Black people North and West as a part of the Great Migration. But let's be clear, uh, for as many, and we I know I have many people in, on the call from the South, for as many critiques as we have and see here of the Jim Crow South, Black migrants found out that the North was, in the words of one, no crystal stair. Migrants, as they reached the North, were immediately met by race riots, racially restrictive housing covenants, discrimination on the job, in the streets, and at the schools, on the schoolyards. But in the face of dire conditions, Black migrants stared this inequality head on. And to paraphrase historian Earl Lewis, they turned segregation into congregation. As you can see here at a Marcus Garvey UNIA festival in New York City, a Model T4 with Black people in it with a placard that says, the new Negro has no fear. How do they manifest this? How did the migration help propel this vision of having no fear into making Black culture and life in ways that we still see to this day? Well, when African Americans were excluded from the banking industry, the so-called liberal free North, they brought their numbers games and lotteries from the South and the Caribbean to build their own pathways to economic prosperity in the midst of financial racism. The variously termed numbers or policy gambling uh, uh, systems became a vast underground economy used to support black owned churches, cabarets, coastal resorts, banks, Negro league baseball teams, and even helping to sponsor writing contests as a part of the cultural expression come to be known as the Harlem Renaissance. This happened until this lucrative financial system was hijacked by Italian and Jewish gangsters in the North, and then ultimately taken up by the ultimate gangster when the US government converted these black games into the state lottery. So it's not a mistake that if you think about it, uh, Chicago was a hotbed of policy gambling, and Illinois was the first state lottery to come online by the US government. So policy gambling is a product of the great migration experience. The mixture of existing black residents and new migrants also gave life to the wellness industry long before Mary Kay and Martha Stewart. Former migrant washerwoman from rural Louisiana, Sarah Breedlove became the mighty Madam C.J. Walker, and went on to industrialize and mass market the time-consuming ritual of doing hair. This act was powerful because it took Black women's bodies back from the mammy stereotypes and the domestic labors of subservience in white women's kitchens. This collective space of doing hair and serving as agents in a beauty, beauty culture, again, before Mary Kay, where Black women fashion themselves, was transformed into beauty culture industry, offering new bodily representations, new professions as beauty culturists and agents, and they even powered Black women into organized politics. If you look on the right hand of your screen, that machine in the very back, if you think about the Marcel Wade that we saw that flappers wore in the 1920s, particularly in France, but also in the US, that is a very time-consuming hairstyle that had to be done with, with curlers uh, individually. So Black migrant from the South moves to Chicago by the name of Marjorie Stewart Joyner. Mar I'm sorry, Marjorie Stewart jo uh, Joyner. Yes, Joyner. She creates, she invents that system in the back where you can set multiple curlers at the same time as the Marcel Wade machine. She gets a patent in the state of Illinois for this innovation. So not only were these Black women culturist agents, they were also inventors and scientists and chemists as the migration carried ideas of freedom forward with the possibilities offered in the urban North. 
finally, music. Think about Louis Armstrong leaving an orphanage in New Orleans, working his way up steamboats up the Mississippi River, first starting and stopping in St. Louis, and then being beckoned by his mentor, Joe King Oliver, to come to Chicago, ultimately transforming what had been a Dixie Band, Dixie Band sound of New Orleans into the innovative jazz style of hot jazz that we still hear to this day. But we know a lot about jazz music as, as well as the product of the Great Migration. But consider the gentleman on your right on the piano, Thomas Andrew Dorsey, who started as a low rate blues player working for the queen of the blues in the middle, Ma Rainey. But he always aspired to be more, to be a star on his own. But he couldn't do it in the jazz and blues world. So he went to a Great Depression. In that period, he began to go back to the church of his origins, of his homeland, of his home from Atlanta, Georgia, and from Villa Rica, Georgia. And in the process of wanting to make it big in the popular cultural world of jazz and blues, but needing the therapy after the nervous breakdown of the church, he began to combine sacred lyrics with blues sounds. He combined these things together and developed this thing that today we know as gospel music, the soundtrack of American sacred life. Thomas Andrew Dorsey invented that, was kicked out of black churches originally because they said, you can't, you can't sing no gospel, you can only preach it, to ultimately transforming both black, white, and multiracial sacred worlds where his music, his gospel sound has become the soundtrack for worship in churches all over the world. Again, a product of the Great Migration with his signature song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Also, at mid-century, America had not yet turned its eyes to Hitler's troops, Hitler's troops storming across Europe. But African-American migrants kept coming north and he immediately saw the handwriting on the wall. As people discussed the growing power of fascism, a word that we've been discussing lately even in contemporary American society, meaning a government-sponsored system of winners and losers based on racial purity, they saw, Black people saw their lives in America. And so when the U.S. finally joined the war to fight fascism abroad, migrants helped call for what they called on the right-hand side a double V. Victory against fascism abroad and victory against racism at home. And these citizen soldiers on the home front would set the tone in the 1940s for what became the Black Freedom Movement. You may know it as the Civil Rights Movement. A number of Black veterans and domestics from the 40s would ultimately become leaders in the Black Freedom Movement. Whether it be zoot suiters like Cesar Chavez or Malcolm X or other people who were uh, 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 on the front lines alongside Martin Luther King, who were veterans of World War II, who became leaders in the Black Freedom Movement or Civil Rights Movement, this whole process was a product of, influenced by, the freedom denied as Black people moved from South to North as a part of this thing that we call the Great Migration. So therefore, in the end, these migrants and their children set the terms of theater, dance, music, fashion, language, prayer, and yes, protest. The conditions of racial exclusion cultivated languages of creative ambition, a freedom dream still hoped for, if not quite yet achieved. And so today, when we see this continuing struggle for freedom and the resilient forms of resistance by things like the Black Lives Matter movement and other social justice movements like the Dream Defenders in Florida. We are also seeing the legacy of the Great Migration. When I look at back at Mary Jo and her parents, my grandparents, on a very personal level, I know that I literally would not be here were it not for their courage and audacity to step out on faith in search of a better world. And I'm not sure if they ever actually found it. As many as you know, African-Americans 
are actually leaving the North and heading back South in ways in which they're again changing politics. The victory um, of turning Georgia from a red state to a blue state or a purple state has largely been uh, attributed to what we call the reverse migration. So again, not sure if they ever quite found it. We are still in this continual search, Black people, this search for freedom. But as Black people moved to Beloit, in my story, they worked in factories and homes, raised their children, joined a church or a club or labor unions, enjoyed the nightlife and endured injustice. They tilled the soil where I grew. So this collective migration story prepared and set the table for where we could all prosper. If you think about food today, American food shaped by the great migration, you think about certain like popular culture with language or dance or, 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 or music shaped by the great migration. If you think about protests, we just discussed that, shaped by the great migration. So no matter where you stand, black, white, Asian, Latinx, Northern, Southern, West. We are surrounded by the innovations that were carried forward by the children of this American exodus. This exodus, this social movement for freedom. Whether we're discussing politics or popular culture, the great migration remains central to our understanding of America. Certainly it's past, but also it's future. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I definitely learned a lot and I, I love how you opened up with your personal story. That really was captivating. Uh, we do have some, we have one question. If you do have questions, please type those in the Q and A or you can type them in the chat. Uh, we will catch those. And there are a lot of really great resources that teachers in the group have shared. So I will get those and share them with everyone in our Canvas course, if you are part of LEAD or if you're part of EPIC. And if you're not part of those grants, I hope you were able to grab those um, as well. So our first question, and please keep those questions coming, is from Susan. And she said she apologizes if it's off topic or random but she's never read much about Ma Rainey's short, um, short of the film, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and she found it to be really good. Do you have any commentary on the historical accuracy of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it is an interpretive take. It's an art piece. But I mean, what's really important about people like Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith, so your, your young people might know about Megan Thee Stallion or Lil' Kim or, or, or uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of other, some, some other powerful women rappers that we might know about today, but even like a Taylor Swift or what have you, um, with the with the sexually explicit lyrics, they think that that they invented that. But Ma Rainey, Betty Smith has some of the raunchiest lyrics you could ever imagine, um, and were also so sex positive. Uh, uh, wrote wrote in their songs about fighting against domestic violence, and uh, Ma Rainey wore men's suits on stage or sometimes sequins gowns, stepping out of a of a Victrola and talked also in her lyrics about same sex desires. So for those young people who are trying to find themselves or understand more about LGBTQ politics, these blues women were at the forefront uh, in the in, 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 in being courageous in talking about domestic violence, talking about the great migration, talking about same sex desires, um, just powerful women um, that should be talked about much more than just simply musicians. Um, so just to answer, you know, to answer that question, my rating at the bottom is definitely the beginning, but just, if you just have your students read some of these lyrics and have in the same way we sat with, uh, 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 strange fruit, read some of the lyrics of these songs and the young people will see and can, and, and connect them with some contemporary hip hop artists. Um, students will be able to see how, um, you know, there's nothing new under the sun and they might be able to begin to ask the questions about how can we talk about women's empowerment? Um, how music becomes a way to navigate current conditions. Um, it could all be very powerful things to make history come alive. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Patty is wondering if you could discuss a little bit about the migration to South Florida. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's really powerful because when we talk about the great migration, we think till this day, it's about 
you know, uh, ignorant rural peasants from the rural South, you know, with still, you know, still with corn between their teeth or whatever, going to the North and being awed inspired by the big urban North or, or the big city. But what we don't understand is that in the first great migration, most people moved from Southern rural, sub, I mean, um, be before the first great migration, in 1900s, 1910s, African-Americans actually first moved from rural areas to Southern cities. So all of the areas around in, the, in, in, in Central Florida would find Black people moving to either Tallahassee or to Miami or the areas around that. So if we think about um, uh, Overtown and uh, uh, Liberty, at the time, Liberty Square, right, um, being celebrated as the Harlem of the South, prosperous Black community, um, but then because of redlining and uh, uh, white real estate owners forcing people from, from Liberty Square to move away from the area as they built 95 South right through the community. And Black people, as they move further and further from the rural areas of Florida, South Florida to Miami, Liberty Square was so condensed and constrained, it became Liberty City. Um, we know that early on, Black people first moved to get to my original point. The reason why you have vibrant Black communities in Miami in the 1920s, in Birmingham, Alabama, in Memphis, in Charleston, in Chattanooga, is because before people moved from the urban South to the urban North, they first moved from the rural South to the urban South. Now, why do I tell that story? Because when we tell the story about how this was just a story of economic, economic prosperity, the point is that even before World War I opened up job opportunities, what was happening? Black people were already moving away from the draconian conditions of plantations in the rural areas to urban Southern experiences. But they got there and faced urban Jim Crow in the, in the South and then decided after, during World War II and after to make the full trek, the leap of faith to the urban North and West. So just want to make you understand, this is why we tell these stories, that these, these stories are hiding in plain sight, but we don't see how they can tell a different tale about why the immigration happened and how. Great, thank you. Amy asks about um, the fact that the Great Migration focuses so much on the industrial pull in regards to factory work. Do you have any recommendations for Black men as strike breakers who migrated along the East Coast? Great question. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, there are some books I could I could send you some recommendations, uh, but the the point here is that when African Americans move to the North and the Northeast. Um, and later the West in the 40s and 50s, but in the first period of the Great Migration, um, labor unions did not allow them into their fold. Even working class white people were being discriminatory against African-Americans. So to the point where the only way in which African-Americans could enter the factories was as strike breakers, or what they call colloquially scabs, to the point where white labor unions, the N-word and scab became synonymous, right? Um, but the point that black labor activists said is that, well, if you let us in your unions, we would not, we could not serve as the release valve for strike breaking. So in the time period, you had independent black labor unions, or later on, you would have uh, the CIO um, as a more expansive and incorporative union as compared to the UAW, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the AFL, opening spaces beyond skilled trades for line workers to get in and African Americans got in that way. But early on, sometimes the only way that African Americans could get onto the factory floor was as a strike breaker. And then even then, they had the worst jobs. So on the killing room floors of meat packing plants, they were in the freezers, sweeping up animal blood. In the Northeast, they couldn't break into the needle trays that were, that were, that were controlled by white ethnic communities. So they were porters on trains, they were stevedores, they were elevator operators, all the service jobs that we're now starting to see come back, where black and brown people are relegated to service jobs, with, you know, the entire economy has become a service, a service economy. So in certain ways, the conditions that black people face historically become a canary in the coal mine, that if we don't do away with racism, the conditions that black people face are gonna be the conditions that everybody faces. We can foreshadow the current service economy by seeing the jobs that were relegated to Black people in the 20s through the 60s. 
So, yeah. And I can send you some articles and, and stuff about uh, uh, strike making labor, labor organizing by black people in the South and in the North and Northeast. That would be great. Ed asks about the migra Great Migration. Is it similar to the pattern of Europeans where um, a brother or cousin would move and then the rest of the family would move? Yeah, so what we call migration chains were were originally, a lot of them informed by um, family networks, whereby even in the music, so like I mentioned before, um, Louis Armstrong said he would have never have gone to Chicago were it not for his mentor, uh, Joe King Oliver, saying, come. And the same thing with families, um, you would have what you call pioneers who would go first and then write home and say, you know, it's okay, you can have good jobs here. And just to be fair, a lot of times the pioneers would downplay the racism and the discrimination that black people face because they didn't want their family to get the perception that they had gone north and been a failure. So they would downplay the struggles that they faced and so that would lure and encourage African Americans to continue going north. So they would have family and friends as a part of their community and family networks. So yes, that would definitely be a part of that story. But the important thing I was saying earlier is that whereby the, the difference is that in European immigration, we tell the story of economic opportunity, but the difference with the black migration is that black people were already in America, right? So many, the, the very prosperity that Lithuanians, Poles, Irish, Italians were coming to, a lot of that prosperity was set by the table set by African-Americans who didn't always have direct access to that very prosperity. Their uneven access to the jobs underwrote the prosperity that was so alluring to European immigrants. So they weren't coming to America as a land of prosperity. They were trying to find some prosperity and freedom within America. And hence going from, from rural South to urban South to urban North and now back to the South, still searching for that freedom. All right, great. Our next question is from Richard. How did the world wars, the military life affect migration before and after? Yeah, it's a great question. So a number in, in, in the, during World War I, even great activists like W.B. Du Bois, he wrote an editorial in the Crisis Magazine, which was the, um, the paper, the, the magazine for the NAACP of which he was a leader. And he said, you know, listen, like in the past, when we fought in military services, we say, let's close ranks, right? Close ranks and, and sacrifice, make a sacrifice by fighting the military. And then that will be a condition for your citizenship rights as you come home. But what happened? Black soldiers fought valiantly on the European front. Um, the Harlem Hellfighters were uh, victorious, and, and, and to the point where the French uh, 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 spent the French uh, uh, nation offered them the Croix de Guerre, the purple, the the, uh, the, the, uh, the heart of war, which is the the highest honor, military honor that the French could offer for the service they offered in the, on the French front lines. But they came back, and what happened on the streetcars? They were ceremonially stripped of their uniforms because white people couldn't bear to see black people in military uniforms. And they were beaten, um, discriminated against to the point that they were um, erupted into the race riots in 1919. Chicago, Washington, D.C., uh, Texas. And this gave rise to what we later would call the New Negro. We normally associate the New Negro with the Harlem Renaissance of being literary and artistic. But the New Negro, if you look at newspapers in 1919, they have their origins in the race riots that came after World War I, when black soldiers came back. And there's a great poem by Du Bois says, we return from fighting. We return fighting. Or you think about Claude McKay's amazing poem, If We Must Die. Right, pressed to the wall, but fighting back. So much of the new Negro political phenomena was borne out by the contradictions of going to fight for America to prove citizenship, coming back and facing a, 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 a amplified experience of racism, giving rise to new Negro politics and resistance. And in fact, Du Bois, who lived 100 years, he lived from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement. Black activists and, and rank and file uh, residents, uh, they, they, as we say in, in colloquial terms, they dogged him for that closed rank piece. And he spent the rest of his life 
doing penance because even he said he was wrong for that, for telling black people to close ranks, to sacrifice themselves for the war effort. He spent the rest of his life trying to write against what he considered to be his sin of writing that piece called Close Ranks because he saw the error of what it meant. Why should black people who should have citizenship rights at birth have to spur the sacrifice for national belonging, for citizenship, only to come home and face enduring and additional levels of racism? Great question. Uh, for the people in the room who are part of LEAD grant in Florida, our workshop in April is on the power of music during the civil rights movement. And Jamie Wilson from Salem State University will be the historian on that. And I think uh, DeVarian laid a lot of great groundwork to consider to continue that conversation um, in April. So Rob asked a music related question. If you could talk about the impact, oops, it just moved, hold on, <laughs> let me head up. If you could talk about the impact of the migration on movement, can connections be made to Jimi Hendrix in Seattle and Prince in Minneapolis? Mm -hmm. Yep, so real quick before I get on that for my Florida people, you should know that the authors of the black national anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, was written and composed by two brothers. James Weldon and uh, uh, I can't think of his first name, but Rosamond Johnson. They are migrants to New York from where? From Florida, right? Those are two both black men that were from Florida residents that migrated to New York City and composed what today we call the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. It was a great little kind of tidbit for you all that are, in the, that are out there. Um, but to ask to go on further, yes, Jimi Hendrix and Prince were both uh, children of the great migration. If we think about the very small black population in Seattle, they, they, they came from Louisiana, Texas, and Oklahoma. His story tra tracks with that story. Prince going to Minneapolis. Um, the entire phenomena of Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, Morris Day, uh, Prince, all the bands of the Minneapolis sound came out of the very small but musically vibrant Black community that created in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Sound. These are both products of a little bit farther removed from blues and jazz, but building on the blocks of that experience of the Great Migration. There's no question about that. But as well, think about things like Motown, Barry Gordy. He created what he called Hitsville as an assembly line of making hits, of a formulaic style that would make hits in American popular culture, like what? like the assembly line at Ford Motor Company where he had worked in Detroit. Again, a product of the great migration. So whether we think about blues, jazz, gospel music, rock and roll, uh, Afro-punk, black new wave music, i.e. Prince, hip hop, experiences products of directly or, 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 or two or three generations removed, of the great migration, not a, without a question, without a question. All right, fantastic. And I see James has a comment on Ray Charles, who of course went to the School for the Deaf and Blind in St. Augustine. Um, so really great. I, I have a lot of work to do. There's some really great comments in the chat. So I'm gonna go through those in the morning and pull out lots of great resources, but thank you so much for being here with us tonight. This was a phenomenal webinar and thank you for coming to talk to our teachers. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. Thank you, I will be in touch by email. Have a great night and thanks again. Again, take care of both you guys. Appreciate it. It was great. I was just texting Shauna. American studies people are the best because they just bring everything in. All the